Welcome to Inspiring Lives with Dr. Shelley. I'm your host, Dr. Shelley Hipsky. All of our guests have conquered obstacles, risen above adversity, and have gone on to help others. Today, we're looking at parental kidnapping. 800,000 children are kidnapped every year. About a quarter of those are abducted by their own parents. 30 years ago, our first guest was taken from country to country by his emotionally unstable mother. She told him that his father was dead. That kidnapping case became a landmark case because it was one of the first test cases of a new law called Parental Kidnapping Prevention Act. Please join me in welcoming Scott Burns. Thank you so much for coming in from New York. Thank you for having me, Shelley. Absolutely. So can you take us back? Can you describe what it was like when you were young? I had a picture-perfect childhood up until the age of eight. Grew up with two loving parents, wonderful suburb called Pittsburgh in Rochester, New York. It was uh, really picture perfect. So pretty, pretty idyllic. Guy. Yeah, up until age eight when my parents started fighting, which uh, ultimately led to their divorce uh, approximately a year later. Okay, so let's take a peek at some happier mm. times then. Oh, so that was their wedding day? That's their wedding day, yes. 1968. And that's, that's myself with uh, my father and my mother in 1971. I'm about three years old there. Can you describe your dad? Tell us about your father. My dad has a great sense of humor. Thank God he's still with me today and we're best friends. Uh, he, is, he will not retire, he accomplishes. Uh, he opened our graduate school about 20 years ago. Oh. We ran it for 11 years. We, we do a lot together. We're closer than, I, our, my experience is, you know, it's a lot closer than the average father's son. Okay. We're, we're more best friends. Okay, so we're gonna go now to a little bit of a darker side because I'd, I'd like to talk more about your mother. D tell me about how she was when you were a little kid. Well, from age eight and below that, um, she was really picture perfect again. She was on um, the long flowing blonde hair, very loving, very caring, you know, PTA, everything that you would expect of a really wonderful mother. Mm -hmm. And there were no bad memories whatsoever. How did you know she was becoming unstable? When my brother was born, I was eight, and um, she, her behavior start changed. Um, my father recognized it. I even got to see it at age eight the fighting, uh, dramatic events. Uh, she tried to kill my father more than once. Oh my goodness. One which I witnessed um, by running under a kitchen table and screaming to my dad. Uh, she was running at him with a kitchen knife. Things really turned drastically, so this wasn't something that came on slowly. It was just a flip of a switch. Wow, really, that, that's scary. Sure. As a person Very in a relationship, you know, it, you, yeah. you have relationships and you, you don't think people are gonna switch it off like that Very and switch it on. Oh my gosh. Okay, so tell me about the parental kidnapping. Well, uh, once my parents actually separated, uh, my mom moved to um, Long Island where her parents were. I was up in Rochester and every other weekend we had to travel back and forth during a custody battle. My mom tried to blackmail um, my uh, teachers where my father was a principal in Rochester oh. of, a, of a high school. Um, she sent hitmen to actually kill him she burned down our house in Pittsburgh, and this all backfired, and my father, in 1979, received full custody of myself and my younger brother. Oh, my gosh. Um, and then upon the first unsupervised visitation uh, in Rochester, New York, um, my mother put us in a taxi cab in the middle of the night, and we went to Boston, at which point we flew out of the country, and we disappeared for the next two years, living in five countries, 13 residencies, constantly changing our name, not going to school, having no friends, uh, becoming very fearful of authority. Wow. Uh, and her behavior became more and more dangerous and erratic as we traveled. Can you describe the erratic behavior that she was experiencing? She would become violent. Um, anything would set her off. There was hitting, there was abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse. Uh, dangerous situations that an ordinary mother would not put their children into that could have just been life-threatening. I can't fathom, like I'm, I'm a mother myself, Scott, you know that, and mm. I, I, can't, I can't fathom that from the mother perspective or from being, being a child perspective and, and what that must do to your psyche as mm. you're, you're growing up during those years. This was more out of revenge um, towards my father than it was wanting to be with me or my younger brother. This was just pure revenge. This, she wasn't looking for the best interests of the children at all. 
Oh my gosh. So you're traveling from country to country. Were there different languages spoken in the different countries? Oh yeah. We lived in uh, Puerto Rico, St. Thomas, Curacao, South America, Venezuela. Absolutely. The yeah. whole goal was to disappear. And if she became paranoid at any time with just uh, a flitch of the finger, we were gone and we left everything behind. Any friends we made, we weren't allowed to tell anyone. Constantly changing our names so we didn't even know who we were anymore. And your father, who you loved so much, you were told that he was dead. Yes, uh, we were told that she had ha actually killed him and there was nothing to come home to. And you believe what your mother tells you. If you can't believe yes. your mother as a child, who are you going to believe? Yeah. And it wasn't until really two years later when um, I learned that our pictures were in the Ladies Home Journal, 1981 August edition, Ladies Home Journal, that my father had actually been searching for us the entire time. Oh my gosh. What what was that feeling like when you saw the magazine or heard about the magazine? Your the your your foundation just falls in. Everything that my mother had told me, I was beginning to realize was a lie. I was only ten years old, um, and she was our only safety base. So um, again, our world just fell upside down. And it wasn't two weeks after I'd learned that the pictures were in the Ladies Home Journal that a babysitter actually discovered the pictures herself called the FBI and uh, that was the most dramatic day of my life. Wow. So when you look back to that day, you said it was the most traumatic day of your life. Were you, well, what, what, what's going on inside? What's coming on outside? Absolute fear, confusion. Um, the babysitter immediately um, took us to the main office of this large apartment complex mm -hmm. where FBI agents were already waiting for us. They responded that quickly. Um, and then they set up a sting to get my mother there. And when she showed up and realized it was a sting, there was a car chase. There was the, the um, drawn guns. It was very dramatic. And oh so gosh. I went from waking up that morning with my mother and going to sleep that night. My mother uh, was taken off to prison. And they didn't know what to do with a parentally abducted child at that time. My brother and I spent the night in jail. They didn't know what to do with us. They put you in jail, and they this was this jail. was in the late '70s. Correct? Yes, it was 1981. 1981. Mm -hmm. Okay, wow. So, how old were you then? You were just little ones. When I was ten. My brother was almost five. In and a jail. They did after they all this traumatic event. Yes, and they had no idea what to do with us. They had no idea. Um, my father was put on the phone with us. Somebody who I thought was dead was automatically put on the phone, and I actually didn't even want to speak to him. I couldn't believe this was all true. And from there, um, this went on for two weeks, a court case where the state of Texas did not recognize my father's custody in New York. And this exploded nationally and internationally. And this is when uh, the president had to intervene and we became one of the first test cases of the Parental Kidnapping Prevention Act. Wow. And for two weeks, we stayed in foster care, a, child, a home for children. And the only source that we learned of what was going on with our mother and father was seeing it on the news. Um, social workers came and went, but nobody knew how to handle us because we were truly one of the first test cases of parental wow. abduction. Thank you so much for, for telling your story to Inspiring Lives with Dr. Shelley. When we return, we'll be joined by someone very special in Scott's life, his fiance Jill. Although she wasn't there during his childhood, obviously, she has experienced the aftermath of his kidnapping. Please stay with us. Judy Ann, and I'm here to tell you about a big miracle that happened in my life on Christmas Day 2000. It was the most desperate day of my life. I was down and out. I had nothing, just the clothes on my back. And I'd been near death several times in my life. I'd tried suicide a couple of times, that never worked. And this time, I had no other option. I went out Christmas morning at daybreak and I just opened up my arms and I said to the universe, take me. Nobody loves me, nobody wants me. I don't love me, I don't want me. Take me and I'll do whatever you want to take me to where I need to be. Well, I'm here to tell you the miracles happen 
straight away. Immediately, within six months, I had everything I ever needed. And here it is, nine years later. And I never thought I'd be in this position in life. Remember, we want to know what's inspiring you. Be sure to go to inspiringlivesinternational.com and tell us your story. We've been talking today about parental abduction cases. Our guest is Scott Byrne. In, his 19, in 1981, his mother kidnapped Scott and his younger brother. Joining us now is Scott's fiance. Please welcome Jill Zabinski Byrne. Thank you so much yeah. for coming in, Jill. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And Scott, when we went to break, you told me that that was only a part of the story. I mean, like for me, my heart like dropped when you were telling me all this story about what happened with, yeah. with your mother and the kidnapping and finding out that your, your father was alive when you were told he was dead. But what was the aftermath like? Well, Take us to that day when you... For those two years that we were missing, um, it was really like a long vacation with my mother. My mother was extremely wealthy and we stayed at only the best places when we traveled. And then when we were found and all of this happened, our worlds turned upside down. I was beginning to learn the truth of what happened to us. And then after this uh, two week long court battle between the state of Texas and the state of New York, and my dad's custody was recognized, um, we were reintroduced to my father in the judge's chamber, a father who I thought was dead for two years. And then my mother vowed publicly that she was going to kill my father and re-kidnap us. And this was on the news. Oh my gosh. Um, so in a covert operation, private investigators, the FBI, my father and my brother and I, we um, got back to Rochester, New York uh, by taking many different planes and being undercover where when we arrived in Rochester, there were thousands of news reporters, television cameras, a scene that I will never forget, even with it being 30 years later. And it didn't end there. Uh, my mother again vowed to re-kidnap us. Um, we had around the clock police protection. When I started going to school again, I had to go with police officers. Um, there was a re-kidnapping attempt by my mother where she had some people uh, in a brown van kidnapped the wrong two kids and left them on the expressway. Oh uh, she again uh, hired hitmen to kill my father with the thinking that if she had killed my father, she'd get us back. <laughs> um, it took years to get back to a normal way of life. Oh my gosh, I, she was clearly so disturbed. I, I'm just blown away by the story. But Jill, you know, I'm a wife too, and, and I can only imagine being a fiancé and, and having a, a, a wonder. I see a beautiful relationship here between the two of you. But I can't imagine dealing with that type of trauma into adulthood. Can you explain to us how it's sort of, it's almost like holding a mirror up. Can you tell us what the reflection is of, of what happened to Scott in his childhood in your own relationship? Um, well, first of all, Scott is a wonderful partner and I'm inspired by him every day and how he's uh, dealt with his past and how he's brought this to be a, a wonderful thing by helping other people. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen the effects of the trauma in him um, and it's, I really can't imagine what it must be like. I know that he has, still has scars, um, however he handles them very well and we're able to talk together about them and how it has affected him. Um, some people have flashbacks of a moment, those type of things. Mm -hmm. have, have you witnessed anything like that? I wouldn't call them flashbacks, okay. but I see effects um, such as, um, just as an example, if he'll hear a, a sound in the night, mm -hmm. he'll get very upset, maybe more upset than maybe somebody would mm -hmm. in, in the situation that had never been there. I mean, he's had situations where people have snuck up um, from the basement and tried to kill his father while he was sleeping. So of course you're going to overreact of course. when you hear a noise in the night. So I've seen little things um, that have affected him and, and I do know it's because of his past. Hmm. Well there's one thing that this show and my books have taught me, it's that these traumatic events can mm -hmm. sort of carry over and the, the past can kind of carry over and then they can carry over into relationships. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I want to know from you, I mean there's other women and men out there in the audience mm -hmm. I'm sure watching this and saying, what can you do to help as, mm -hmm. as a, a person in that relationship? Can you tell mm -hmm. us what, what you do to help Scott through this? 
Sure. I mean, I don't, honestly, he doesn't need a lot of help because he's an extremely strong, amazing person. But I think that um, one thing I can say is being just really supportive, really patient, understanding, mm -hmm. and just listening and just understanding that, you know, maybe if he's um, overreacts about something, I do understand why. And just kind of look mm -hmm. back, th look at what he has been through and see what that pattern may be. He, he's very sentimental. He looks back a lot to his, you know, the good parts of his childhood before he was eight. And sometimes, um, and I do understand that he needs to hang on to that because those were the good times. And after that, it got, it got bad. But just understanding and being patient, understanding that um, we need to be really stable and no drama. Just mm -hmm. cut the drama. It's too mm -hmm. much after everything that he's been through. How do you do that? Like. Uh, I've been known to be a drama queen myself. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it. So how do you do that in a relationship? Um, luckily, we're a very good fit. And I believe that we did come together because we both don't want the drama. That's but, awesome. You know, but just a quiet life and just really simple God. Um, has been the recipe. It takes uh, a lot recipe. of work from both people every single day to just treat the other person the best you possibly can. Communication is so important. My mother taught me everything by her doing the opposite Absolutely. and what to do. I never run from a problem. We talk. There isn't anything that can't be spoken about. It doesn't have to be yelled. There, has there doesn't need to be any drama. If we all communicate and look at the other person, and what we say to each other is so important every day. There's no room to you know, put somebody down or, or in any kind of way. Yeah. There's no need for fighting. You can discuss anything. We don't raise our voice. We don't. There's no need for that. He's been through enough and we can just talk and you know that was really the downfall of his parents relationship all the fighting and the 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 unnecessary drama there's Absolutely. there's no need for it and by the communication and by living this kind of way um, people with children are able to put the best interests of the children first and that's yeah. why I'm here is to talk about making a difference in children's lives we have to put the kids first um, Absolutely. I, I'm such a believer in that you know I'm, I'm a former teacher and and, and a mommy of two kids, so that I'm a huge believer in that. So thank you so much for sharing that method, message, both of you. Um, up next, Jennifer Hain joins us with this week's Gratitude Giving segment. Then Scott Byrne will be back to talk about how his abduction equipped him to help others at the national and international level. Please don't go away. Inspiration is just a story. Jennifer Hain and this is Gratitude Giving. Today I will be representing a company that is phenomenal. The name is Women's Bean Project and I'm not sure if you've ever heard of them before but they are truly something special. Women's Bean Project was founded in 1989 by a woman named Jessie Eyre and this actually all came about when she visited a homeless shelter for women to do some work there. Now she saw that the homeless shelters provided safety for these women However, it didn't provide a lasting impact. So she went and, to make a long story short, gathered $500 worth of beans and took it back to the shelter and put two women to work. She then realized that she could provide training and employment opportunities to homeless women through this foundation. And so I'm here with Dr. Shelley Hipsky, and we will be sampling one of the products from Women's Bean Project. Well, I was blown away. These, these all came into to the Inspiring Lives, and I just, I love it. Yeah. I mean, we've got gluten-free cornbread, mm -hmm. Grammy's Snickerdoodle mix, oh my gosh, black bean soup mix, a little salsa mix. I mean, it was, it was just amazing, all yeah. these different products that they make. And my daughter and I actually had the opportunity last night to bust open one of these packages. And what I love is that each of them is lovingly handmade by, and they actually sign their name, which is so Very cute. Sweet. I was Very tell, personal. Yeah, I told Ali, I said, you know, Lori made this for us. And, and we opened it up, and there was all these little baggies of things in it. And I was like, this is great, because I am not the best cook in the world <laughs> or baker in the world. So, like, I pulled out a little thing of mixed, like, sugar and flour. And I pulled out the little oatmeal stuff and, I, and the little chocolate chip. 
Allie was like in heaven. I bet. Like, I bet. She was like, yeah, I just Tim Dougie. <laughs> but it was it was so it was a nice bonding experience for me and my daughter Definitely. to be able to make something that's also empowering women around the world. Absolutely. So here is the moment of truth. Are you ready? I'm so ready. I am so. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's give a little try. T taste a little. Of, what are these? These are. Women's Bean Project chocolate chip oatmeal cookie. Wonderful. Let's try a little piece. Okay. I can't there wait. There we go. Okay, can I just yeah, a little Yeah, I'm gonna. Bite this here. one looks like it has a little bit of chocolate chip <laughs> in it. So. <laughs> mm. Oh my gosh, that's really good. I like the oatmeal. I in was it. just gonna say. <laughs> I was just gonna say the oatmeal. And the, the you know the chocolate chip. They melted a little when it was yeah. in the mailing, so it's like a, you get a big chunk of chocolate chip. This <laughs> is really good, really good. Oh now, I want to say you can purchase all of these individually. You do see the packages here. However, they do make individual salsa mixes. They make spiced rum, awesome. chili, soup. Mm. So, and they are all organic as well. I love it. Yes. So, you know, through Women's Bean Project, they have been able to create a lot of employment and training opportunities for these women. That's fantastic. Yes. Well, I'm so glad that we, we got to learn more about the Women's Bean Project today. Yeah, and gratitude giving. And thank, thank you, you so for much. joining us. <laughs>
and by doing positive things we can make a difference in the lives of others and most of all we need to educate in order to prevent parents from abducting and put the children first and uh, that's what it's all about absolutely children in their futures I totally agree and so. I, I feel so lucky and blessed that you came on our show to, to spread you. this message of um, Per about parental kidnapping and keeping kids safe. I think it's always better to be preventative than to be reactive. Absolutely. I think that if we're always on that side of the coin, then we're going to be a lot better off Couldn't agree more. as a society. And that's why I'm out there speaking about it. That's why I wrote a book. That's why I'm on my mission. Awesome. Well, we love your mission, Scott Byrne, definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And a special thanks to both Scott Byrne and his fiance Jill. Scott once said to me, let's make a difference together, and th that was his purpose in speaking out, and I'm glad that we were able to do that today by sharing Scott's journey with you. Until next time, I'm Dr. Shelley Hipsky, and remember, inspiration is just a story away. We look for you in every face.